You know, it's pretty hard to screw up money in the bank. Just stick some creative and athletic wrestlers out there, hang the briefcase from the dangly apparatus, rent a few ladders from the local hardware wholesaler, book a surrounding undercard that at least moderately slaps, and voila, you've got a license to print money. In the bank. Well, apparently that simple science can sometimes fall just beyond the grasp of the dolts holding the booker's pencil. While not every single money in the bank has been a slam bang home run, one in particular stands out as an absurd mess. You know, the sort of show that clickbait bloggers and engagement tweeters would endlessly trash in exchange for, say, a plate of gourmet cold cuts. Bad finishes and bad booking combined with an overall dearth of energy, indicating that the creative for this money in the bank was backed by insufficient funds. The 2017 WWE Money in the Bank is one of the worst shows ever. The year is 2017. Man City has a mere four league championships to their name. The Nintendo Switch has hit store shelves and gouger's eBay listings for the very first time. The President of the United States is now a WWE Hall of Famer. I know, don't blame me, I cast my illegal right in vote for Abdullah the Butcher. The policies we want, the unsanitary forks we need. 2017 was also the year WWE continuing prodding through a bloated corpse of 2003 by making all of its secondary pay-per-views brand specific. A year earlier, WWE undertook the old brand extension once more, dividing its talents between Raw and SmackDown. It's a reasonable way to give more people a chance to be seen on TV, mind you, but man, does Survivor Series season get extremely tedious. Death to SmackDown! All of them annihilated! Death to SmackDown! They're the scum of the earth! Death to Smack! Fraser, actually, you've been drafted to SmackDown. Oh! But aside from character logical gaps wide enough for a Mad Max war convoy to pass through, the brand extension does serve a practical purpose. This second go at having a split, however, produced a new problem. See, back in the first split, the brand exclusive pay-per-views were all basic in their construction. No way out, bad blood, no mercy, you get the picture. None of them were defined by a specific gimmick, with the lone exception being Taboo Tuesday. Events like Hell in a Cell, TLC, Elimination Chamber, Night of Distraction finishes, these, these didn't come along until after WWE started having all hands on deck once more for its non-Big Four events. So holding money in the bank with less than half the active roster at your disposal, since Raw has a larger talent pool due to being a three hour show, comes with some obvious risks. I mean, you're going to take six wrestlers from 40% of the WWE main roster, put them in one match, and hope to have enough worthwhile names to fill out the remainder of the card. Well, fortunately, WWE had an ace up its sleeve. Because this would be the year that for the first time ever, the women would have a Money in the Bank ladder match all on their own. Yes, Becky Lynch, Charlotte Flair, Tamina, Carmella and Natalia all had the honour of competing in the first ever briefcase ballet for women. Coming just two years after, Stephanie McMahon invented women's wrestling of course, her brother Shane invented the first ever five women ladder match for a future title shot. So great of Shane to pull up those bootstraps, or rather firmly tuck his jeans into his Nikes and work on advancing a long neglected WWE division. And to show just how committed WWE was, the audience was treated to a video package where the five entrants sat down and discussed what an honour it was to have this opportunity. This was no ordinary ladder match to appease the event name, this was history making. And WWE of course made sure to hammer that point home. Yep. Can't wait to see this history take place. Of course, there's also the men's ladder match whose participants include Kevin Owens, Sami Zayn, AJ Styles, Shinsuke Nakamura, Baron Corbin, and Dolph Ziggler. Pretty sturdy feel, right? Naturally, the mind reels at all the possibilities of what the eventual cash-in will look like. Imagine the pop for Sami suddenly zeroing in on the champion. Or maybe a remorseless KO takes advantage of a wounded title holder. 
Hey, who's to say that Dolph doesn't try to re-attempt his timeless cash-in from just four years earlier? Say, who is the reigning champion at this point? Oh, yes, WWE was knee-deep in their let's put the top belt on a known mid-carder in a transparent appeal to a fertile international market phase of being, which commenced at the prior month's event at Backlash, where Jinder Mahal went over Randy Orton. It's really a shame that Portugal wasn't like a pro wrestling hotbed in 1995, because Aldo Montoya suddenly upending Diesel for the belt. Well, that would have been pretty damn funny. Certainly would have changed the landscape of wrestling as we know it. Now, not to compare Jinder Mahal to a crappy new generation character, because, well, none of this is his fault. The title reign, which ended up being stretched to nearly six months, really failed to make a dent in the Indian marketplace as, well, nobody really bought Mahal as champion. Still, we're destined to do this for a while, so Orton's invoking his rematch in his native Saint Louis, no less. And I think this was the first time that DraftKings offered the guess the inevitable screwy finish prop bet. I took the gateway arch falls on him at plus three million because one day, I'm going to hit on a long shot and then have enough money to open open like a cultaholic themed ice cream parlor. Maltaholic. Come on, you know you want to try the Adam Pa cheesecake. For the first women's money winner, she could potentially cash in on champion Naomi or perhaps her pay-per-view opponent, Lana. Now, this was certainly an interesting pick, seeing as Lana had only wrestled one televised main roster match so far, and it was on the pre-show of the prior year's WrestleMania. You know, people people take issues with AEW's rankings. In tag team action, the Usos would put the blue brand belts on the line against the New Day's Big E and Kofi Kingston, recently moving over from Raw. Kind of hard to screw up a match between two of the best WWE tag teams of the 2010s, and hey, this gives the thinner undercard a reliable anchor. Speaking of tag teams, Breezango and The Ascension were set for action, playing off that whole Fashion Files things where Tyler Breeze was attacked by unknown assailants. So he and Fandango demi- Uh, I wasn't meant to reveal that part. I've just realized I've, I've blown the whole reveal because you weren't supposed to know it was The Ascension until later in the night. Wait, that, that, that was it. It was a, it was a hugely disappointing reveal. Nobody cared. Nobody even remembered it until I brought it up just now, right? Oh well, anyway. I guess I just saved you some needless suspense. You're welcome. Remember to hit like and subscribe and do all this stuff down below. Leave a comment while you're at it. A strong 15,400 fans attended Money in the Bank at St. Louis Scott Trade Center. In a shocking turn of events on the kickoff show, Pachiti's spirit animal and Hasbro's biggest customer won in tag team action over Primo and Epico. It wasn't shocking because I, I didn't realize Primo and Epico were still with WWE in 2017. I figured they quit years ago in protest of the Jeremy Piven Raw or something. Remember that? But forget about Ari Gold, let's talk about golden moments, like the first ever Women's Money in the Bank ladder match. The St. Louis crowd, along with the millions watching around the world on whatever legal or illegal stream they've opened up, are witnessing history. It's an unprecedented moment in WWE annals, and hell, the company has told us that as well. Becky, Charlotte, Tamina, Mella, and Natty commence the match, and it's okay for a while, nothing too wild or outlandish. We get a pretty cool spot where Carmella climbs up and around Charlotte to go for the briefcase before Tamina cuts them off. Charlotte and Tamina have an admittedly ugly sequence involving some spears, but still, this is all fine. The match motors along, Becky goes for the briefcase, only to get dumped off by Carmella's sidekick, James Ellsworth. <sighs> no big deal, it's just a spot to get some heat. Having the heels, you know, resort to some chicanery. You know, it's wrestling 101. It's not gonna hurt the match anyway. Ah, sh Ah. Uh, Ellsworth has retrieved the briefcase on Carmella's behalf. The first ever women's Money in the Bank ladder match is won by a dude, as foretold by the prophecy or the format sheet, either or. 
<laughs> if you were on the wrestling interwebs of 2017, you might recall the scorching level of backlash for this particular ending. All that hype around the first of its kind match in the stated name of gender parity, and they run with that finish. Now, one could argue that the blatant subterfuge was a good way for the heels to get heat. One could also argue that a joke sidekick on the secondary show of a big level pay-per-view isn't going to generate beneficial heat, even if he were a technician at the local day spa. It was so bad that WWE actually ran the match back on SmackDown a week later due to the controversial finish. This was so they could have actual footage of Carmella retrieving the briefcase for future video packages. And they just pretend like that was the pay-per-view match ending. Because this is always the sign of head-on straight thinking, right? Hey, can you five recreate that high-risk spot fest only make it last a little bit longer and actually have the winner of the match retrieve the briefcase? Because, well, we kind of effed up the first time though. Not your fault though. Fortunately, the Usos and the New Day for the tag belts is next. If anyone can keep the train from barreling off the tracks, it's these premier tandems. Just give them time to cook. And cook they do. For a dozen or so minutes, we get some inspired action. Though the spot where Biggie attempted to catch Jey Uso in the big ending was a tad rough, it's quite forgivable, however, because you know those four will cook with gasoline all the way to the thrilling fin- You serious? The Usos take an intentional count and loss. If I like my match endings the way I like my Jenga tower collapses, abrupt and with zero forethought, this would be my favourite pay-per-view, but I don't. So it's not. Besides, Connect 4's... <laughs> Connect 4's way more my speed. Naomi and Lana are next for the women's title, and, and to be quite frank, it it's, it's just not good. Lana was greener than the event logo, very green, and this match just screams placeholder feud. A teased Carmella Cashin gives us a distraction finish so lengthy it makes Austin Powers steamrolling that security guard feel like an RKO out of nowhere by comparison. Still, three very different bad finishes, at least there's variety. We then come to what is very clearly the highlight of Money in the Bank so far. Maria Kanellis returning alongside husband Mike Bennett, or rather in this case, Mike Kanellis, to the strains of the greatest power ballad this side of Skid Row's 18 in life. In the temporary Kingdom divorce, Matt Taven won the Ring of Honor title at Madison Square Garden, while Bennett got this theme song. Hard to say who made it out better. Honestly, it, it's, it is far too good. It has no right to be this good. Here's to the greatest, greatest. Mahal and Orton was next as the mood now shifts to, look, you can put Jinder over if you want. Just give us a finish that isn't lame. Like their backlash match, it's not lousy, but it doesn't scream this is for the WWE Championship. Lots of rest holds, little flash, and only mild crowd interest at most. If this match were for the TNA King of the Mountain Championship, I'd think, wow, this can't be good for that belt's prestige. But just when I'm about to add this match's soundtrack to my bedtime white noise playlist, we get, and you guessed it, a bad finish. The ref ejects both Singh brothers from their ringside malfeasance, upon which they seize Randy's father, Bob, in the front row, seen amongst various legends. Now, logically, Bob should just be up both Singh brothers himself, since his forearm cast alone weighs as much as Samir and Sunil do individually. However, he is instead stupefied by a bad case of plot convenience, for which there is no known cure, except for a swift creative overhaul and maybe a couple... Flintstones chewables. Son Randy then goes to save the legend. How, well, how ironically ironic. And he beats up Sing 1 and Sing 2, both starring Matthew McConaughey, rated PG for mild violence and some rude material. They're actually quite good films, particularly the first one. And then falls victim to Jinder's Cobra Clutch Slam, The Colas. Orton and Jinder would then face off at Battleground the following month, a show that I have flat out refused to review until I'm assured hazard pay and additional personal time off. The ball is firmly in your court, Mr. Pachiti. After that white knuckle thrill ride, they send out Breezango and the Ascension to act as a buffer. I think somebody won, but I was following the lead off the St. Louis crowd and taking a bathroom break. I'm sure the winner is listed on Wikipedia, but well, that's not always accurate. So instead, I'm gonna ask Luke to just throw up an image right behind me, right there, 
of who won the match. Thanks, Luke. We cap off the night with the men's money in the bank ladder match. Near as thine eyes can tell, there are no chinless ring siders that are threat to legally procure the briefcase. So that's a start. All told, it was a pretty excellent match from an action and quality standpoint. I mean, how could it how could it not be given the field? KO and Sammy are well, no strangers to ladders. Corbin can do some impressive power stuff. Dolph, can, well, Dolph can bump for twenty men, and Styles and Nakamura are supreme. Just as long as all six men don't get counted out following the Usos out of the building, then this match should stick the landing. And it sure looked like it was going to. Once Nakamura made his grand return from getting jumped by Corbin before the match even started, the last seven minutes, particularly once Styles and Nakamura had their showcase, about justified the entire sorry event to this point. Uh, and then Corbin won. And look, he wasn't the first Corbin to claim victory in June 2017, but he was certainly the first one to have a wolf on his shirt when he did it. This set up the possibility of Baron Corbin chasing Jinder Mahal with the briefcase, which, oh boy, <laughs> let me hit up the ticketing app right now and see where WWE is coming to my area. I better get those front row seats before they're all picked clean. Look at me go. <laughs> I can't pull out my phone fast enough. <laughs> Don't want to fumble with the screen. <laughs> All the good seats might be taken. Oh, by the way, I was being sarcastic. Unfortunately for me, I was not in Providence, Rhode Island the night Corbin cashed in his contract on Jinder, only to lose in six seconds after some John Cena tomfoolery. Man, for for all the good that was, they may as well have reshot the match and had Carmella win that one too. If you didn't know any better, you'd think the guys from Impractical Jokers produced a gag format sheet, slipped it onto the table at Gorilla, and laughed in another room at the outcomes. There certainly have been worse shows from an action standpoint, but the 2017 Money in the Bank failed in its sheer execution. There wasn't a single relevant outcome with any satisfaction to it, just one FU finish after another. A heel pushing over a ladder with two baby faces on it was the second least screwy finish of the night, practically by default. Heels, and not even wildly popular ones, won the three biggest matches on the night, with none of those results making a big difference over the next six months. Carmella wouldn't even even cash in her briefcase until after the following year's WrestleMania. Subjectively, you could say the relegation of the event to just one brand removed the star-studied appeal from what is often one of the most highly anticipated shows of the year. With so much emphasis on getting heat on the bad guys, Money in the Bank should have been called Stomping Ground but with ladders. The 2017 Money in the Bank is one of those shows you don't really condemn for the wrestling quality, but rather the cliched and half-baked creative. It's clear that no matter how rich the action is, it's hard to stay excited when the narrative is just so bankrupt.